Hello. In the gap between Folk on Foot episodes, I thought you might be searching for something wonderful to listen to. So here's a suggestion that I know you'll enjoy. One of my favourite podcasts is The Outdoors Fix, presented by hiker and journalist Liv Bolton. Her aim is to inspire you to get outside and make the outdoors a bigger part of your life, which is an idea that, uh, as you know, we're very much in favour of here at Folk on Foot. In each episode, Liv goes for a walk with people all over the UK who've changed their lives to get outdoors more in the hope that their stories and tips will help you do the same. It's really atmospheric. You get practical advice about subjects like hiking, wild camping, cold water swimming and landscape photography. And the guests include people like a shepherd, a mountain rescue volunteer and a ranger. Liv's really well qualified to present the show because in 2018, after years of working in the high-stress environment of London newsrooms, she took a career break and walked 800 miles down the South Island of New Zealand on a long-distance hiking trail. The three months of being outdoors every day changed her perspective on life and work and led to the creation of the Outdoors Fix podcast. Now, normally, of course, the Outdoors Fix is recorded, well outdoors, but that wasn't possible during the COVID lockdowns. So when I was a guest in 2020, Liv and I connected online. We shared our love of walking and talked about Folk on Foot. And if you've ever wondered what inspired me to start Folk on Foot or what it feels like to record some of the most spectacular episodes, here's your chance to find out. Hello, I'm Liv Bolton, and you're listening to The Outdoors Fix, a podcast to inspire you to make the outdoors a bigger part of your life. The Outdoors Fix is produced in association with our friends at Ellis Brigham Mountain Sports. What if you could combine your passions into your dream outdoors job? My guest in this episode, Matthew Bannister, has done just that. He presents programmes on BBC Radio 4 and was the boss of Radio 1 at one point. But in the last few years, he's also managed to merge his love of walking, the outdoors and folk music into his work. The result has been his podcast, Folk on Foot. In the episodes, Matthew goes for a long walk with folk musicians in a place that's special for them, and they talk and sing along the way. He set up Folk on Foot in August 2018, and it's gone on to win several awards. I was intrigued to find out why Matthew wanted to move his audio work outdoors and how he did it, as well as discover how important walking has been to him through difficult periods of his life. Coronavirus put a stop to our plan to go walking together on the South Downs Way. So for our chat, I was in my flat in London and Matthew was at his home in West Sussex. I hope you enjoy this episode of Matthew's story. And don't forget to listen out at the end of the podcast for the relaxing minute of Sounds from Nature, recorded by some of you. To kick things off then, here's a short clip from Matthew's podcast, Folk on Foot, to get a taste of what we're talking about. That wonderful writer about the natural world and about walking, Robert McFarlane, says, a walk is only a step away from a story and every path tells. And that could be a manifesto for Folk on Foot. It could be a manifesto for this podcast, except, Robert, what we do on this podcast is we add in songs too. So on these paths, we hear stories and we hear wonderful songs. Matthew, hello. Thank you so much for coming on the Outdoors Fix podcast. It's a delightful pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. I am currently in my flat in London, looking out on a fairly grey day, but some terrace houses. Whereabouts are you? I'm in my house in West Sussex, just near the South Downs. And uh, if I look to my right from here, I can see a view over the wetlands, um, which is a bird sanctuary and a site of special scientific interest. And I'm sort of on top of a cliff. So what happens here is that uh, birds fly past our house at eye level because uh, ah. they're on the thermals from down below. So we just had uh, we've just had three red kites uh, oh. circling overhead, and the bird life here is just uh, amazing. And then the the wetlands flood. So at Christmas and quite recently, actually, 
it was just a sheet of water and now the water's receded and the grass has come back and we get a herd of deer that go past our house as well. It's a really beautiful place. That is not a bad spot to be dealing with coronavirus and these times. We're obviously quite locked in here, but the, the great thing about it is that we can see the outside world, even if we can't go out into it. And when we go for our one exercise walk every day, we can actually walk up the South Downs, which uh, is one of my favourite places in the world. So that's, that's pretty good. Why do you think that area is so special? How does it make you feel when you're out there? Well, uh, I first moved to West Sussex now over 30 years ago. And uh, so I've always had a, a place in this kind of landscape. And there's a, there's a wonderful variety about it. You know, first of all, you have the rolling chalk of the of the downs themselves, this sort of great escarpment that, that threads its way through the, the landscape. Uh, but when you're on the top of it, you can often see the sea. And you can see the sun glinting off the sea on a, on a sunny day. And then if you look to the north, you might see the North Downs. Um, so the views over uh, the land are, are spectacular. But it's a, it's a kind of a gentle countryside. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in the Western Highlands of Scotland, which is anything but gentle. You know, it's a rugged, uh, fearsome landscape that on a stormy day can be quite scary the south downs even when it's raining there's something benevolent about it about that rolling chalk land and about the sheep grazing uh, and about the, the the way that the landscape unfolds so so i love the gentleness of it but i love the fact that you've got this spectacular panorama from both sides of the of the way Outside of Folk on Foot, you have a very busy BBC presenting life. Do you find that when you're out walking in the South Downs way, it's a way to relax, to decompress? Uh, whenever I'm walking, it's a way to relax and decompress, whether I'm in the countryside or, or in a city, actually. And I do like walking in cities, too. Uh, but yes, of course, going out into nature has, everybody knows now, I think, um, has a particularly benevolent effect on your mental health. And, and it's interesting because I was walking with a musician called Sam Lee for my podcast. And, you know, we were having this conversation. And I said to him, you know, walking is a great time to have intimate conversations because you're not looking the other person in the eye. So you walk alongside them and you've got time, you know, because you're on a, a long walk. Then conversations not limited by, oh, I've got to rush off and do this or I've got to rush off and do that. The pace at which you walk enables conversation. He said, yes, but. He said, sometimes we should just shut up and listen. So walking on your own is, is, a, is a time when you can really experience nature and really feel nature, uh, not just chatting to your companion, not just you know looking at what they're saying and thinking about what they're saying, but walking on your own, listening to birds, listening to the wind in the grass and so on. I find that incredibly therapeutic. I want to come on to Folk on Foot in just a bit, but I'd like to explore where did your love of the outdoors come from? Did it come from your childhood? Yes, yes, it very much did. And uh, I wouldn't have said that at the time, by the way, uh, but I was born and brought up in Sheffield. And the great thing about Sheffield, well, one of the great things about Sheffield, I better be careful, uh, yeah. is that uh, where we lived anyway, you can get very easy access to the Peak District. And, you know, we could be out in the Peak District in a sort of 15 minute car journey. And then we'd be walking uh, in that spectacular Peak District countryside. And my parents were very keen on doing that. And they took me and my two brothers out there a lot. And we often uh, on holidays would be involved in walking. All our holidays when I was a kid were in the UK. Uh, we used to go to Scotland. We used to go to the Lake District. We used to go to uh, Snowdonia. We used to go to Norfolk. But they would always involve some kind of walking. I can even remember uh, when we were on holiday once in the Lake District, my mum and dad and my, my littlest brother was very young and they took, a, took him out in a pushchair. And I remember us going across a ploughed field with him in a pushchair. <laughs> they, they were determined to... to kind of make those journeys um, w w with the kids and to, to introduce us to walking outside. I often complained um, and I was often resistant. I'm not trying to pretend that I fell in love with it straight from the off, but I think somehow it got into my psyche. And as I got older, um, I began to rediscover the joys of walking. And the other thing about walking for me is that I used to walk home across Sheffield in the early hours of the morning because I didn't 
have any car or, you know, when I was a teenager, I'd go and uh, be listening to records late at night in one of my friend's houses. And we you know, kind of finish at two in the morning and I'd think, oh, there's no buses. There's no I'll have to walk home right across the city. And it's a city of seven hills. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would be really interesting up and down walking and you just meet the odd dog walker uh, on your way back. But again, that's when I got the bug for perambulation as a time to think and a time to, you know, reunite with your own your own soul. Your podcast, Folk Comfort, then, it's been going since 2018. Where did the idea come from? Well, Folk Comfort is really about three passions of mine, and they've always been there through my life, but they've kind of been submerged from time to time. But walking we've talked about. Folk music uh, was something that I got into again in Sheffield when I was a, a teenager, and I started a folk band, um, and uh, I was in this folk band with a guitarist and a singer. Um, the first ever time I appeared on the radio wasn't as a reporter or a presenter. It was doing a session on BBC Radio Sheffield with my folk band, Hob. Uh, and we played a song Fantastic. called I Want to See the Bright Lights Tonight by Richard Thompson. And uh, uh, last year when my mum sadly died, uh, I, I was clearing out the loft. I discovered a cassette of that performance oh, uh, how really extraordinary which you kept all these years so folk music walking and then telling stories in sound has really been about my whole career you know that's what I do for a living that's what I've done you know right from when I was a reporter at Radio Nottingham right back in the late 70s uh, I've been fascinated by the, the ability to tell stories in sound and so when podcasting came along I thought blimey you know I can I don't have to get anyone to commission this I can just bring together these things that I love. I can work with some really talented producers and we can put out there something and see if anybody comes. And they, they have. It's become incredibly popular and it's beautifully produced. I mean, I really love listening to it. I don't particularly have much knowledge of folk music, but I've been listening to it in the past few months and it is, it is a really wonderful listen. I definitely recommend it. And I also just love the way you record it outside because your producer is fantastic at recording the sounds of nature, which is really hard to do, actually. I mean, I try to do it myself and I'm often getting so many noises of wind and you know everything in it but there's some beautiful bird song that she captures why do you think that there's a great relationship for folk artists then between the outdoors and uh, and walking and, and folk music folk music has always had a sense of place so it very much definitely comes from somewhere you know the 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 people who handed it down from working person to working person you know, were known for the singing in West Sussex or known for singing in Northumberland or known for singing in a particular part of Scotland. And they sang about the area in which they lived. Um, and so the idea that folk musicians are rooted in the sense of place is not a, a new one. It's a it's a very obvious one to them. And so when you say to them, you know, would you like to walk in a place that's inspired your music? They go, yeah, of course. Uh, what we do is this, this and this. And that's true even, I think, of because you know, quite a lot of the people we're walking with are writing their own material right now. It's contemporary material, it, but it's part of that tradition. And, and even the contemporary material often has a very strong sense of place. I mean, I've walked recently with a, a, a young folk singer called Kitty McFarlane, who comes from Somerset. And uh, we walked on the Somerset levels and, and her music is imbued with the Somerset levels. And she's a, a twitcher. She's a, a real bird watcher. And she took us to you know, a bird watching hide. And she's written about the birds that she experiences and loves. Um, and so it, it makes absolute sense to folk musicians when you say, will you sing about the place where you come from? So you've recorded, I mean, all around the UK, from the northwestern tip of Scotland to Port Isaac in Cornwall. Um, one of my favourite episodes was with Nancy Kerr, where you walked along the canal um, in Wiltshire. And then also recently, your most latest that I've listened to is Bella Hardy, and you recorded Walking in Edel in the Peak District. And I was there just a few weeks ago before coronavirus started. It's, it's just wonderful. Where, where's been the most favourite place you think that you've recorded? And that's sort of like asking somebody to choose between their children. Do you know what I mean? It's quite, <laughs> it's quite difficult. But I, I, when I answer this, you know, I, I, I always pick this one place out because it was really unique. And uh, it's a place called Sandwood Bay, which um, is on the northwest tip of Scotland, just around the corner from Cape Roth. And 
when you go there, it's you park in a car park, but it's a four mile walk to get to the beach. So you have to walk a, across the hinterland, past some lochs, some inland lagoons, um, and then suddenly you come round a corner and this white sand beach just opens up in front of you. Um, and there's a sea stack at one, one end and Cape Roth at the, at the other end and this great expanse of white sand. And on the day we went, I'm sure it's not always like this, but on the day we went, it was bright, bright sunshine with oh, a cold wow. wind, but bright sunshine. So we had hats and gloves, but we had sunglasses as well. And there was nobody else there. Um, and I went with a Scottish fiddle player and composer called Duncan Chisholm, who had written a whole album about this beach. He'd been inspired by the beach and he'd spent, he'd gone there about 12 or 13 times uh, just to soak up the atmosphere, seen it in all its glory in all the different weathers. You know, one of the pieces that he wrote was about this storm coming towards you from the sea, this great black cloud and, and rainfall coming towards you from the, from the waves as you stand on the beach. Um, and others were one called Dizzy Blue, which is about birds going up into the blue sky as he walked to the beach. And so he played his fiddle on the beach for us. And we stood and watched the waves rolling in. I, I, I tell you, it's, I thought I'd gone to heaven. And he said, you know, that they, uh, the, the ancient uh, Scots used to say that it was a thin place where the distance between heaven and earth is very narrow. Uh, Sandwood, and, uh, and and I loved that image of it. So that was definitely a memorable one, but they've all in their own ways been memorable. Did you ever think that your career would take you to somewhere like that? I never thought that I would ever be able to design my perfect job. And I have absolutely designed my perfect job. You know, I've had lots of jobs um, and I do a, a film show showing some of the films that we've shot while we've been in these spectacular locations. So we do always take a a filmmaker with us because I, I realized quite early on you want to capture the visual as well as the audio but we only do short you know um, one or two minute promo films we don't do massive films but I, I do this show and I and I start off by saying you know I've been a barman uh, at a hotel in Sheffield I've been a verger at Sheffield Cathedral I've been chief executive of BBC production I've been controller of Radio One but the, I've now designed at long last aged 63 i've designed my perfect job and i think a lot of people when they've seen the movies and listen to the podcasts agree with me you have some uh, really beautiful moments of nature in your podcasts uh, lots of stunning bird song and then sometimes bumping into lots of sheep and various things along your walks what do you think has been the most special uh, moment that you've had interaction with nature on your walks well it was particularly stunning well two i'll give you two which are both about birds actually but uh one of them was on Fala Moor, which is in midlothian uh, just south of edinburgh uh, near the home of an artist called kareen polwart and she made an entire theater piece about this moor called wind resistance and it's a moor where the pink-footed geese come to overwinter and and thousands of them go there um unfortunately they weren't there when when we where we went there but there was an awful lot of other bird life and there was just this wonderful moment when a curlew uh, started circling overhead as Karina and I were talking and it just it just kept singing over our heads and you can hear it in the in the podcast the recording was absolutely wonderful here he comes gosh he's so close oh, here he is amazing that was a really memorable moment. Another was when we went in the middle of the night with an artist called Sam Lee, um, who does this thing called Singing with Nightingales. And uh, what he does is he invites people to join him in a Sussex wood or a Kent wood during the nightingale season. And you, sit, you start by going on a little walk around the wood um, at dusk to hear the dusk chorus. And he always brings an ornithologist who can spot the different birds and point out the different bird song that you're hearing to you and then you sit around a campfire and he gives you wonderful vegetarian food and he starts to tell stories and sing songs about the nightingale and when it's pitch black at about 11 11 30 at night he says right we're going to go and find the nightingale now and you set off in in silence in single file and in the pitch dark no torches or lights allowed so you have to really trust the person in front and behind you and you go to walk through the woods uh, on a winding track. Uh, and actually, in, in one of them that I went to, up on a, onto a disused railway line, and you start to hear a nightingale singing. And they sing at night, 
because uh, they can be heard. There are no other birds singing and because they're trying to call down their mates who are migrating. Um, and so the nightingale's song at night is the, is the strength of its song, is the way it attracts the best mate. So it doesn't mind when, you know, 15 or 20 of you arrive by the thicket where it's singing, sit down and listen, and then Sam Lee starts to sing a duet with the nightingale. Wow. And you hear this extraordinary duet, and I would swear to you, and I, I think everybody else there would, that the nightingale responds to the human voice and you get a, a call and response. As I was a walking one morning in May down by the green meadows all along by the grove. Have you had any, I mean, tell me about some of the most difficult moments you've had recording outside though, because like we said, it is very tricky sometimes. It is very difficult and wind is your enemy, uh, you know, because wind makes this extraordinary roaring noise on microphones. And so uh, I remember we went to the Hartlepool headland it's not all beer and skittles on this podcast. We went to the heart of I've been to Scunthorpe as well and uh, Epping Forest and through the East End of London. Uh, but we went to the Hartlepool Headland to record with a, a group called the Youngins, who are fantastic um, three three part singers and who come from that area. And there's this historic gate on the Hartlepool Headland called the Sandwell Gate, a medieval gate onto the beach where the fisher folk used to bring their catches in. And they've got a song about this. And, and I said to them, I'd be lovely if you sat, stand in the gate and sing the song for us. Uh, and we got there, the producer said, no way, because the wind was whistling in through this gate. So we took a photograph of them standing in the gate, and then we retreated around the corner behind some wheelie bins to actually record the music <laughs> <laughs> where we could find shelter. So that was a, a tricky one. And with Bella Hardy in Edale, uh, Bella is a fiddle player and a singer, um, and she lives in, in Edale, um, and it was chucking it down, absolutely siling it down. And of course, she was game for a walk in the rain, and so am I, but musical instruments don't really go well in the rain, and uh, people who care about their musical instruments don't want to put them out in pouring rain. So what we did was we, we managed to take refuge in her mother's cottage halfway around uh, our walk, where she made us tea and biscuits, and then played this exquisite music for us, and we recorded it, and then went back out into the, the wind and the rain. So uh, we, we kind of had a bit of a way round getting completely soaked. It's all part and parcel, isn't it, of it all? I mean, I've had some horrendous recordings. Some of my guests will realise that. And we've been in the rain and sopping wet and then had to retreat to the car. But it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all, all part and parcel of it all. Um, outside of the podcast then, I think you mentioned to me that you do a walk with friends each year. Tell me about yes. that. Okay, so uh, it was in. It started in the year 2000. So this year we would have been doing it for the 20th time, except, of course, it's been cancelled uh, because of the coronavirus. But um, it started because uh, my late wife and I thought that it would be really nice to do something to mark the millennium um, and to tell our children that it's 2000 years actually since the birth of Christ. Um, and uh, so we said, well, why don't we do a pilgrimage at Easter of the millennium to an English cathedral or possibly two English cathedrals? And on that first walk, we walked from uh, Petersfield to Winchester and then from Winchester to Salisbury. Um, so and it was absolutely chucking it down then, I, I, I seem to remember. Mm -hmm. And it was a group of friends uh, with their children. And the, the younger children didn't do all the way. They did bits of it and then, you know, dipped in and out. But the adults did the whole way. And so w what we did was we started on the Thursday before Easter, uh, had a good dinner and then walked through Good Friday, stayed overnight, then walked through Easter Saturday, arrived in the cathedral city on the on the end of Easter Saturday and then go to the Easter service on on a Sunday. And that's become an annual tradition. And so my children are now... Uh, 35, 36 nearly, and 30, and they still come on it. And indeed, my grandson came on his first one the year he was born. He's, he's having a bit of time out now because he's three and he doesn't really like walking, but he was carried on, on the, when he was very little, he was carried on the first walk. And the, and the three or four families who've been involved have kind of dipped in and out over time, but we've always kept doing it. So we've been all over England 
is doing it. We've been to, you know, Canterbury and York and Ripon, and we did a lovely Gloucester, Tewkesbury, Worcester uh, walk, and we've done Bath, and uh, we've done St David's in Wales, along the Welsh coastal path. And it's become a kind of annual pilgrimage. And my, and sadly, my wife died, but we do it also in memory of her. So we, we come together and, and remember her uh, every year uh, at Easter. And, and I thought the children would fall by the wayside when they became teenagers or, you know, got other interests. But um, I'm just amazed to find that, by and large, they haven't. And they still like to come and they'd like to connect with, with that group of families. Oh, what a wonderful bonding experience. That's a really lovely thing. And a lot of my guests in the past have said that walking and the outdoors has helped them through difficult times. And, and it sounds like it, this has been a wonderful, you know, the pilgrimages and the walks has been a wonderful way to remember your, your late wife. Has, has the outdoors helped you through the difficult times in your life? Undoubtedly, yes. And, and you know, um, uh, Sheila, my wife, uh, you know, was a great fan of the South Downs as well. Um, and she's buried not far from where I live now, um, looking out over the South Downs. Um, so, you know, it's a way of, of remembering her. My, my current partner is a keen walker. So she and I uh, go out walking together uh, on the Downs uh, as well. And yes, when, when there's been uh, trouble, when there's been sadness, when there's been, you know, anguish, I, I found that getting outside, you know, breathing fresh air, looking at a view, connecting with uh, bird song, connecting with the grasses and uh, and the flowers and all of the rest of it is just a, a balm to your soul. I thoroughly recommend it to anybody who's feeling a bit down and a bit depressed. And, you know, I know at the moment it's difficult for people to walk, but, you know, if you can, and I, as I say, I walk in London, so, you know, there's plenty of green space in London as well, you know, and, and I know some of it's been closed, but there's some still open. And if you can get into a green space, we walk through uh, to the Brockwell Lido uh, with Kerry Andrew, a wonderful singer, um, through Brockwell Park uh, in South London, which is a, a beautiful restorative place. So if you can get outside and you're feeling a bit down, do so because it lifts you. Absolutely. With Faux Comfort, I know that there's a pause on recordings at the moment outdoors, obviously for a lot of podcasts as well. But where would you love to go walking with Folk on Foot when everything returns back to normal? Well, I've already got various things up my sleeve, actually. I've got some, <laughs> I've got some episodes that we've already recorded, which haven't been released yet. I've been walking uh, down the Holloway Road in London with an artist called Frank Turner. Oh, yes. Uh, he was just a brilliant, uh, brilliant singer. Uh, came from a punk background uh, and who started his whole musical life on the Holloway Road in various clubs that we went and visited. And he got quite emotional as he played inside the clubs where he started out, you know, some years ago, where there was a whole scene involving people like the Mumfords and Laura Marling, and it, it, he was part of that scene. So we've done that walk. Uh, we've been in Faversham in Kent with an artist called Chris Wood, who was having a bit of a, an existential crisis about uh, the Brexit vote and was very upset about that and has written some quite interesting and powerful songs about that but also he's written a lot about the allotment that he's got in Faversham and he took me for a walk in the marshes there and we talked about the poet John Clare so that's a lovely one and then the episode with Kitty McFarlane in Somerset so those three are, are yet to come I've been to the Isle of Skye uh, oh, with beautiful. a harp player called Rachel Newton for a festival called the Small Halls Festival which is just amazing thing because they uh, what they do is they bring over some of the top Scottish traditional musicians and they people who don't often play together and they form this kind of folk supergroup and then it tours the little village halls around Sky, And so we were, we were recording some of that and then we went for a walk with Rachel and her harp near the Fairy Pools, which is a well-known uh, beauty spot on, on Sky. I had to carry the harp, I must say, nearly did my back in. Uh, <laughs> but we, we got this amazing music of her playing the harp as the water cascades down over the rocks on, on the Isle of Skye. So what do you think Folk on Foot has brought to your life? First of all, the major benefit, which is an incredibly selfish one, is that I get to stand in a beautiful place and have a private concert, for one, by some of the finest musicians in the United Kingdom. And that's an enormous privilege. But secondly, I think what people say about Folk on Foot, the listeners tell us about Folk on Foot, is that it's a transportive and restorative experience to listen to it. 
And it's certainly a transportive and restorative experience to make it. We kind of pinch ourselves when we're on the train coming back from wherever we've been walking, that we've had the privilege of standing in some of these gorgeous landscapes and listening to this extraordinary music. And I think you'll find when you listen to it also that the musicians are often very interesting and reflective people. So I think you get philosophical insights from them uh, that often surprise me or make me think in a different way. It's often educational as well. You know, you learn about bits of history of the area or, you know, this is what happened here or this is what happened there or I was inspired by this historic event and you learn about natural history. So it's got all of these things, all these enriching things about it for me as the person who makes it. And I hope and I'm, I'm pretty sure they communicate themselves to the people who listen to it. Absolutely. I do completely agree about you. the the singers and the musicians are so reflective and they make you think about life in a different way. So final question then, how would you sum up what the outdoors means to you? The outdoors means almost everything to me, actually. <laughs> it, it means solace, retreat, thinking, companionship, spirituality, and an uplifting sense of our place in the world. Matthew, who are the three people who have inspired your outdoors adventures? Well, I have to start with my mum and dad. Uh, because they always took me walking, particularly in the Peak District, when I was a kid. And although I resented the experience at the time, um, I know that it got under my skin. And, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart every time I, I go for a walk. So I, I'm really inspired uh, by them. Uh, I should then probably say one writer who I adore is Robert McFarlane who I'm sure you'll know, um, and if you don't know him, please go and read uh, all his books. Um, his latest one, Underland, is very scary, but uh, he writes so passionately and beautifully and evocatively about the natural world. And I had the privilege and pleasure of interviewing him on stage at uh, Folk by the Oak with Jackie Morris, the artist who he created an amazing book called The Lost Words with, and I've been inspired by their their work. So. That's that's another area. And then the, the third area is, I think I've just named two folk artists, actually. Corinne Polwart, who created this amazing theatre piece called Wind Resistance, which is about the moor, Fowler Moor, near her home. Um, and she worked with a sound designer called Pippa Murphy. And she created uh, special music, and then they used the sounds of the moor. And then uh, Corinne told you stories about the people who'd lived on the moor, about its history, uh, and about the wildlife and, and nature of that place. And when I, when I saw the show at the Edinburgh Festival, I thought, I have to go for a walk with Corinne there and, let, and get her to tell me about these things in person. And, and that's what we did. And the other one is Sam Lee, the singer who took us into the bush in the middle of the night to hear a nightingale. And he is a, nat a naturalist himself. Um, he's very attuned to the natural world. And he has all sorts of interesting insights into what you're seeing, what you're hearing as, as you walk with him and, and sitting and listening to a nightingale in a, in a bush in the middle of the night in Sussex and him singing is just absolutely inspirational. So I'd, I'd credit them too. What tips do you have for getting outdoors more? I would just say, if you can, walk. Because uh, it's so tempting to get on a bike or get into a car or get onto a scooter and, you know, make everything convenient. But if you can, use your feet. Because I think that you will have a better experience, whether you're going to the shops or whether you're taking an expedition, you know, along, on a long journey. If you walk and you connect through your feet to the landscape, then I think you will have a far superior experience. And there is something human about the speed of walking. It's natural. It's what we do naturally. Uh, so walk and then you will absorb 
the, the joys of the countryside better. And listen is the other thing that I would say, because it's all too easy, and I'm guilty of this a lot, to chat on when you're out walking, and then you miss half of what's going on, because what's going on is in the sound of nature, whether it's the wind in the grass, or, or the birds calling, or the sheep, the sound of the sheep's call, or whatever it is, you, you should listen uh, when you're walking. But walk, above all, walk. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much. It's been really lovely to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed for having, having me on what is an amazing podcast too. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks for listening to Matthew's episode. You can see photos of Matthew's recordings of Folk on Foot on the Outdoors Fix website or on Instagram at the Outdoors Fix. You'll also find his podcast on Instagram at Folk on Foot. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to make sure you get all the episodes when they come out and please rate and review the podcast to help other people find it. You might also like to check out the dozens of other episodes we've published since the Outdoors Fix started. Now, it's that time to hear some sounds from nature that you, the listeners, recorded. These clips are from Izzy and Deal in Kent, Jenny and Paul in New Zealand, and Jackie in Buckinghamshire. So lovely to be a guest on the Outdoors Fix with Lib Bolton. She has loads of other amazing episodes which transport you into the outdoors to meet fascinating guests. So while you're waiting for the next episode of Folk on Foot, why not search for the Outdoors Fix wherever you get your podcasts and become a subscriber now.